Hello, my name is Stephanie, and if you're looking for a review on White Oleander by Janet Fitch, you are definitely in the right place. I don't know why this is so hard. Okay, so I've already tried to record this review, um, and when I watched back the footage, I realized I was triggered the entire recording of the footage, which was a long, was a long video. So I wanted to re-record it and make sure that I discussed the book and stayed on topic and stayed in a mentally safe space. This week has been a very clinically depressed week for me to struggle with clinical depression so uh this week was a not great mental health week for me um i'm on the up and up but it was a little bit of a struggle i think coming out of being sick i got behind on a lot of my goals and my chores and things like that and i think that just didn't set off a lot of good chemicals in the brain so i had to like work out spend time with my friends have lots of hugs get the endorphins running in my brain <laughs> so that way i can get back on track with this channel because i'm really dedicated to doing a video a week this year, but I do have to be forgiving of myself when the bad mental health weeks come by because they will and there's only so much I can do about it. <laughs> if I'm a little awkward in this video, it's because I'm feeling a little vulnerable sharing that all with you. I'm brushing it off with lots of smiles and quirky little dances, but yeah, just know I'm feeling a little vulnerable today, um, but I'm feeling safe, so I feel like I can make this video. I'm sorry that's a lot of disclaimer to put in front of the book, but I will say that there's a lot of psychology and mental health that goes into this book, so it's a little relevant. <laughs> And uh, I think puts me in a position that, to uh, relate to this book in a way that people without depression cannot. So without further ado, let's get into the review. Really quick synopsis from my perspective. We are introduced to Astrid, who is in the beginning of the book 11 years old. She's living with her mother, who is a writer. She is a poet, and she lives her life very poetically. She gives her daughter advice such as never fall in love, and love doesn't exist, and things like that. And uh, overall not the most mentally healthy situation. Astrid's mother Ingrid ends up in jail and Astrid is then put into the American foster care system. We follow her as she goes through six different foster care homes, how each one impacted her personally and her life and her fantasy of her mother. It's a really heartbreaking story but it's so poetically written that you almost forget that what you're reading is so heavy. It really makes heavy, heavy topics feel light as a feather, and you breeze through a chapter without even realizing what you've read is actually very, very deep and very, very heavy. So I'll quickly go into the uh, spoiler-free part of this review. So overall, I absolutely adored this book. I think because of how personal it was to me, how much I related to certain aspects of this book, and how beautifully written it was. Like Janet Fitch's writing in this book is just incredible. I haven't read anything else by her, but if her writing in her other books is anything like this, I definitely want to pick it up and I want to read more about her. Um, I don't usually go for glossy hardcovers, I'll try to hold this at an angle at which it will not blind the camera, but uh, it's very, very shiny. I highly recommend this book to really anybody. I uh, think that age appropriate wise, it's probably best if you're high school or older to read this book. Even then it hits on some topics that are very, very adult, very mature. The only reason why I mention that is because uh, there is a lot of tragedy in this book and it can be a lot for, um, I think it can be a lot for the emotionally um, not as mature people to absorb, but also I think it might, a lot of the aspects of this book, a lot of the subtle things in it might go right over the head of somebody who um, maybe hasn't experienced as much life. But I think anybody in the foster care system could read this book and feel very validated and seen. I mean, I can't speak from a place of experience because I've never been in the foster care system, but I did grow up an orphan and I struggled with a lot of the same things that Astra did. I feel like this book was really honest. I feel like Janet Fitch was really honest about the psychology, the mental health, the emotional health of, uh, and the physical health of the process of going through the American foster care system. I've heard some nightmare stories. I have not met many people who've been in the foster care system, but I have met some. And because of what I've heard and what I've learned from what I read about in the news and things like that, I have always wanted to be a foster parent. Ultimately, I feel like this book is about an American system that really fails our youth and the people who really need us most and the people who need mental health care the most. This book perfectly outlines why I feel like therapy should be available to everyone and anyone, especially younger people who have been through things like the foster care system, the loss of a parent or a close family member, etc. The writing in this book is absolutely brilliant, perfect, wonderful. I feel like this is this book is a perfect example of a writer taking every tool in the writer's belt to create art. This book is art, in my opinion. I definitely have to trigger this book for sexual abuse, childhood abuse, um, complicated adult-child relationships, 
uh, self-harm, suicide, depression, anxiety, PTSD. I believe this book would be a trigger for people who have survived narcissistic relationships. I didn't realize how triggered I was reading this book. I'm the type of person who does not shy away from books and media that will trigger them. If I see a trigger warning that I think applies to me, I usually read or watch it anyway. Um, and I didn't even notice how much I was triggered while reading this and when I first tried to record this book review earlier this week um, until I watched the footage back. And so now that I'm more aware of it, hopefully I can talk about this in a little bit more of a productive way. But I absolutely love this book. I think this is definitely in the top three of my favorite books now. I mean, for the spoiler-free part of this review, all I can do is sit here and give this book all of the praises ever because just it's definitely going to be the best book that I've read all year and I can already tell you that because just to me this is a masterpiece. I think it is an example of brilliant writing. I think it is an example of intelligent writing. I absolutely love this book, but it is definitely more on the mature end. I thank my friend Michelle for recommending this book to me. She's the reason I put it on my 30 books to read before I turn 30 list, and I'm really, really glad she did. That's really all I have to say about it in the spoiler-free part of this review, so if you have not read the book, go no further. Go read the book, come back to this time signature, and we can discuss in the comments or on my Instagram, my bookstagram, which is bookstagram stuff in the DMs. Spoiler alert going into effect now. All right, I'm gonna try to talk about this book a little bit more on topic than I did the first time. I mean, if you've watched my book reviews before, you know I always relate the book back to my personal experiences in my personal life and the validation that I got out of the book. I read this with my friend Michelle's book club and uh, one of the girls mentioned while you're reading really he heavy topics you almost forget how heavy the topic is because of how poetic the writing is and I absolutely agree with that. Because I don't feel like while I was reading the book I was very triggered. Um, I felt very comfortable in the reading as far as the way she was describing things and the events that were happening because the writing was so beautiful that I almost forgot I was reading a tragedy. But discussing the book back I realized in when I first tried to record this review, I was definitely triggered, at least at that point. Alright, first of all, I didn't realize a white oleander was a flower. I used to garden, so I'd never heard about it. But I do think it was a perfect title to the book, not only because of the part it plays in Barry's death, but also because it's a beautiful flower that flourishes and thrives in hostile conditions, which I feel like is such a great metaphor for Astrid. She is this beautiful thing that um, thrives each time it goes through the tragedy, so I feel like it was a really good metaphor for Astrid herself. Immediately in the beginning of the book, I absolutely did not love Ingrid. I don't think Ingrid's designed to be liked or loved or idolized. You do find yourself idolizing her or liking her, I feel like that is the design of the character because there were a couple points where I felt a little sympathetic toward her, but at no point did I really think she was mentally stable. I'm not a mental health care professional, but psychology is my passion in life and I am studying it and have been studying it my whole life and it is really near and dear to my heart because I've been in therapy my entire life and I will say with all the knowledge that I have, with the people that I've encountered in my personal life, I feel pretty comfortable saying that I think Ingrid has narcissistic personality disorder. I don't know if Janet Fitch designed her after the narcissistic tendencies and personality traits of people with this disorder, but to me it was like almost a perfect example. I have unfortunately interacted with people like this in my life and have been in situations where I was not fully in control of how much involvement in my life they had. In that respect, I felt for Astrid, especially in the beginning of the book, I was terrified for her. Once I realized that there was definitely a mental health issue not being addressed with Ingrid, mentally or emotionally unstable parents can do a lot of long-term emotional trauma to their children, and I just was on edge the entire beginning of the book. A question I forgot to ask in our book club meeting was whether or not we felt that uh, Astrid was better off in foster care than being raised by Ingrid because Ingrid was very unstable and not a good mother by any means in my opinion. I think because we get to see how Astrid turns out and how the events of her foster care experience changed her for the better. Um, not saying that I think anybody needs to go through half of what Astrid went through to turn out a good person, but because she did come out of it a good person, a stronger person, a more um, centered person, I think it's probably better that she was raised in foster care instead of raised by Ingrid. In my mind, if Astrid was raised by Ingrid, I see Astrid as this 
person who is completely dependent upon her mother for all validation and success in this world. If her mother says that she shouldn't do it, she wouldn't do it. If her mother says she shouldn't want it, she won't want it. And therefore never become her own person, therefore never realizing her own potential and her true desires in this world um, as far as wanting to be an artist or a painter. I see an Astrid whose personality is completely bulldozed by Ingrid's desire of what Astrid should be. And what she should be is aspiring to be her mother, in Ingrid's opinion. I see an Astrid completely isolated from the world, um, an Astrid who doesn't know how to interact with other people, or who is terrified of other people. Ingrid basically had no close friends. She had no intimate relationships, and therefore when she went to jail, Astrid had nowhere to go but foster care. And I feel like, as a parent, it is always your responsibility to make sure that you set your child up for if you're not around. Just the complete isolation from any other relatives or friends or family or intimate relationships um, that Ingrid created in Astrid's life. Astrid had to go into the foster care system. So essentially, if Ingrid could make any meaningful relationships in her life, I feel like Astrid would have been better off. That would have been the perfect solution, which is, you know, Ingrid goes to jail for being mentally and emotionally unstable, and then uh, Astrid is then raised by a close relative and or family member or guardian um, who is stable and is an already established relationship in Astrid's life. That would have been ideal. The metaphor and symbolism used in this book is just incredible. I mean, starting with the white oleander, in my opinion, representing Astrid, that was really amazing. I feel like Astrid's initiation into foster care, the first family that she went to, I believe it was with Star, where um, she meets Star's daughter. I think it was her biological daughter. Her name is escaping me right now because there's a lot of names in this book. I'm really bad with names. But scene where the coveted uh, Ingrid journals that Astrid has with her, the ones where she reads about her mother and her mother's fantastical life. and. These journals are basically an imprint of what Ingrid thinks she is. She thinks she is this goddess-like creature who knows all, who can tell what a person is, what they want out of life, what they should be, based off of one look at them. Um, this kind of fantastical fantasy of what she thinks she is, written down on paper, and Astrid adopting that image of her mother, wanting to protect that at all costs. Um, Star's daughter coming in, finding the journals, and when she's caught ripping up the journals and chewing them up and spitting them out, essentially, was such a great metaphor, in my opinion, for taking Astrid's fantasized version of her mother and this fantasy of her mother that she had coveted her entire life and chewing it up and spitting it out. And by the end of the book, we see Astrid confronting that fantasy of her own mother. We see Astrid forcing her mother to confront that fantasy she has of herself, and Astrid realizing before Ingrid does that her mother is not all these fantastical, wonderful things that her mother thinks she is, and that it would take the foster care system for both of them to realize that, essentially. I thought that was an amazing metaphoric moment in the book. It was also extremely foreshadowing of what Astrid's journey through foster care would be, where she would have to be tough, where she would have to protect her things and herself, but also it would take the image of her mother, chew it up and spit it out, and by the end of the book, she would see her mother for what she really is. Within Star's household, we have Uncle Ray, and Ray is such a complicated character. Um, what he did, by no means, is appropriate or okay or legal. I feel like this book makes a really good point as to why there is an age of consent in most developed countries, because while Astrid is consenting in this situation, um, I think just as important as what you're doing, um, while understanding why you're doing it is essential. To living a safe and productive and healthy life, you need to understand why you're doing what you're doing as well as letting your actions speak for themselves as to what kind of person you are. Her entire life, Astrid had seen her mother use sex as this tool, as this way to get control and to have power and to use it instead of enjoy it as a consequence of a really close connection. So Astrid, having her first taste of freedom, not really knowing what to do with it, takes what she learned from her mother and using sex as a way to feel in control of a situation she has no control of, um, as well as feeling the power that came with it. I feel like this was her first, the first thing she ever did without her mother telling her she should or should not do it. 
And I feel like this was Astrid's first taste of power and she took it too far. I don't think what she did was right or okay. And I feel like that's why we have an age of consent is because as the adult, Ray should be able to acknowledge and realize that while yes, this child is saying she wants sex, he should be able to be the one to acknowledge, oh, she doesn't know what consent means truly yet. She doesn't know why she's doing this. She just knows, okay, I want to do this, so let's do it. And I think that's the big shift you go through from the age of 15 to like 25, is by 25, hopefully you realize why you want what you want. Healthy sex within a relationship, to me, is a consequence of a, a deep, meaningful connection. I think when I was a teenager, I thought that sex created a deep and meaningful connection. It was like the graduation or the level up of a relationship. I felt like having sex is what made the relationship a little bit deeper and more connected. I think as a, an adult now in a healthy long-term relationship, a healthy sexual relationship is a consequence of a healthy romantic and personal relationship. It's not something that makes the relationship healthy and personal. It is definitely something that can enhance a relationship, but it's not something that makes a relationship. I think the fact that sex did become emotional for Astrid, where she felt this um, claim over Ray, she felt possessive of him, and she felt um, essentially in love with him, uh, says a lot about the way that her adolescent brain viewed sex and why we have an age of consent. So that way you would just have a little bit more time as a young adult to realize why you want what you want, to be taught the consequences of uh, sex in a relationship. Had Ray gotten her pregnant, had he got, given her an STD, she would that would have been like years of healing and just consequences that Astrid would have to deal with that Ray would not. And so as the adult in the relationship, he really should have done better. But I realize that that's something you can expect of a healthy, a mentally healthy adult. And I don't think Ray was mentally stable or healthy either. The other metaphor I thought that was really amazing was when Astrid found the Wilderness Survival Guide, where she used that and the teachings of the Survival Guide to survive. I think it was a really great reminder from Janet Fitch that what she's doing in the foster care system is surviving. It's not thriving. She is not in a safe environment. She is surviving a hostile environment um, that requires a set of tools. I'm so happy that Astrid had the ability to take the teachings of the survival guide and apply it to her own life. That's essentially what therapy is, in case you're wondering. Um, in case you have some kind of uh, bias or, or you look at therapy as this thing that only unhealthy people go to, it really is just a place you go to to learn the survival tools you need to get through this life because um, our society is, and culture is not designed to be a mentally healthy and safe place. You need to take care of yourself emotionally and mentally in this world. And the really the only people who can teach you how to do that are um, stable and healthy adults or therapists. I feel like the character of Livia was actually um, a metaphor almost in and of herself. I feel like what she was is what Ingrid could have been if she was a little bit more mentally and emotionally stable because Olivia essentially used sex in the same way. All the wonderful things that Astrid's mother was, but better. <laughs> and I feel like it said a lot about Ingrid that the more that Astrid wrote to Ingrid about Olivia, the more that Ingrid rejected the idea of Olivia and the idea that Olivia could have any influence on her daughter, it said a lot about Ingrid's self-hatred because I almost saw Olivia as a mirror image of Ingrid, but if Ingrid made better choices in her life. And I think that Ingrid, I think Olivia forced Ingrid to acknowledge the mistakes that Ingrid had made in her life and she didn't like that and she, that's why she rejected Olivia so intensely. There's also a great metaphor in the power of words in this book because I think somewhere at the beginning of the book there was a scene where Astrid talks about how when they moved to the United States and she had to take a test to see um, if I think the phrasing of the book was to see if she was retarded. Astrid says something to the effect that she was upset that her mother didn't give her more words to essentially prove she was capable of more than this test was going to reveal. And how the letters and how written word was kind of this currency between the two of them. Like her mother's like, I give you this, you give me that. 
Um, and at some point, Astrid takes back her power and says, no, I'm not going to write to this woman anymore. All she does is neg negatively influence my life, so I'm going to take away that power by not writing to this woman and not reading her letters. And at some point, she sits down with a caseworker who gives her the giant stack of letters she hasn't read yet, and um, Astrid says, I don't have any letters for her. And the caseworker says, well, you know, other kids would be really glad to have their parents write to them. You should feel fortunate, essentially. And this is where I got really triggered the first time I tried to record this video. It's taken me years to process the damage that the adults of my life did to me as a, a child who became an orphan. They essentially would invalidate my experience by saying, oh, it could be worse. Do you know how many kids would be so thankful to have a sister who would take care of them or a roof over their head? And while all of that is true, when you say that to a younger person, you're invalidating their experience. You're basically saying, oh, well, what you're going through is not so bad. Compare yourself to others to see how good or bad your life is. You have not earned the right to complain or be sad or to mourn or to do any of these things because somebody else has it worse than you. And that's just not what grieving, that is just not what trauma is. One of the worst things you can say to a young person is it could be worse because you think you're trying to give them this wake-up call saying, oh, well, you know, your life could be worse, so why don't you be thankful for what you have? But to them, what you're actively doing is invalidating their experience. What you need to be doing is helping them process their experience and asking them, what is it you need from me as an adult in your life to help you get through this, to help you process this? Let me give you tools that I have developed as a healthy, mentally healthy adult um, and pass that on to you. Here's how I process my trauma, here's how I've processed. And if that doesn't work for you, let me help you get the help you need. You need a therapist, do you need group counseling? Do you need grief therapy? What is it that you need? You tell me. Do you need a glass of water? Do you need a hug? Do you need some space? I can help you make sure you have that space. You know, um, that's what you should be doing. And this caseworker saying that to Astrid really triggered me. I went on, I think for about 25 minutes in the original recording of this review about how that is one of the worst things you can say to a young person going through a traumatic experience. And I think in order to keep myself in a safe space and not get too vulnerable about it, I'm going to end my rant there. But that scene really got to me. Part of what I loved about the scene was that Astrid stood her ground and was like, I'm not gonna write her letters. And then when she started reading the letters, instead of actually writing her own words, instead of investing herself into her mother, she took her mother's words cut up the words and piece together different sentences um, and sent them back to her mother. So that way Astrid was trying to connect with her mother, but only by reflecting to her mother her own words, her own uses of words and things like that. And it just enraged her mother. And usually when you get rage like that, it's because you have shame involved. Ingrid as a narcissistic person, in my opinion, um, would not handle shame well, and she didn't. So that scene and the whole use of words as this tool or metaphor or um even i might even call it a weapon um because i think that ingrid tried to use her words as weapons to control astrid's life and then astrid rejected that and astrid took back her power and then astrid used her own words to improve her own life and no longer invested her own words in her mother and i absolutely loved that concept i could talk about this book for days and days and days so if you want to discuss it more feel free to comment or DM me on my Bookstagram account, which is linked below. I'm Bookstagram Steph on Instagram. But I think to prevent myself from ranting about the mental health issues brought up in this book, so brilliantly brought up in this book, by the way, I'm going to stop the review right here. <laughs> there are more things I wanted to talk about and more things I wanted to address, but I think but I think in order to do that, I would have to get pretty vulnerable. And I think I'm just in a place where I'm not ready to be that vulnerable. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign off and say that Till next time, I will definitely see you later. Bye.